All right, we're back to exploring the life of Elisha. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. We're exploring. We're just turning the pages and finding out what's there. Last week, crazy story with incredible teaching points. Week before that, crazy story. With, well, today, crazy story with incredible teaching points. So let's just, let's just explore and see. So here's, here it is. We're talking about the apprentice. We shouldn't call him the apprentice anymore because he was the apprentice of Elijah. But now he's pretty much, well, he's on his own. Elijah's gone and he's doing his own thing and he's making marks in the Bible that in some senses are even bigger and better than Elijah, the guy who taught him. So that's what's interesting. So this is part two of the Syrian threat. We're going to have three weeks of the Syrian threat and uh, the Syrians, which is exactly ethnically and geographically the same as the Syrians that were in the news this week. Just, you know, a couple thousand years between them. The same, same group. Uh, sounds of war. So today is the sounds of war. We're going to go from the end of 2 Kings 6 into chapter 7 and just see what it is. So here's, here's the preview. This is where we come from. Syria is actively warring with Israel. Instead of one great battle, skirmishes are attempted throughout the land of Israel. That's the same as last week, by the way. And then uh, the military, militarily superior Syria has gained the upper hand. And they've surrounded Samaria, attempting to starve it out by siege. Now, this is different from last week. We had the Samarians attack last week, intending to do that, and they were thwarted by God. This week, God allows them to do that. Oh, it's interesting. And last week, by the way, too, just to remind you, at the end of the story, it said, remember, the Syrians no longer invaded Israel. And then the next verse, and so they invaded Israel. So that's how we, that's our key that these are actually chronologically out of order, that they put these in the book as a collection of stories, some that include great war stories, some that are just small stories. So uh, they're out of order. But anyway, so here we go. It's, it's Syria, the same Syria t- ethnically today. And so Elisha relays God's promise of help. So let's just dive in and we'll see what it says. So here we go. Scene number one, this is a, from 2 Kings 6.24, and uh, it's a serious siege from Syria. That's as much alliteration as I could fit in one phrase. So, so, there. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. This is where we start. Verse 24. Afterward, when it says afterward, the previous verse was Syria didn't invade anymore. So afterward, Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria... <laughs> mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. The entire army of Syria went and besieged. Now, you, you know that in a, when you do lay siege, usually the people, they, they kind of, your people you're attacking, they go inside a city that's got big high walls and a big gate. And as long as they stay inside there, you can attack it. So strategically, what you do is you just starve them out. You just make camp and don't let anything go in, anything go out. They'll eat up all their stores of food. They'll die or very weakened. And once you sense they're very weakened, you basically just go in and kill everybody. So that's, that's what's happening. So it's this long waiting process in the siege. By the way, if you go to Israel today and you visit where Jericho is, there's a dig at Jericho, When Jericho was first dug, uh, they found a lot of curious similarities to the Jericho story, not the least of which is the fact that there were jars with grain, food grain, storage grain there at the site. The top of the grain was slightly burnt, the place was burnt, but the grain jars were largely full. Well, when a city goes under siege, uh, they'll eat up those food stores so you can can tell how long they're under siege if, if the jars are empty. Well, these jars weren't empty. They were nearly full, which tells you that whatever took down Jericho, if it was a siege, it was only a very short siege. And we know that it was a week when you come to Jericho. So that actually fits, to, fits what you'd expect to see. So anyway, here's Ben-Hadad. Who's Ben-Hadad? Well, you know, we haven't read his name, but he does, he's in, this, it's in the second Kings. And uh, the last time we, he, we find him, he's back in first Kings 20, Right after that scene, remember where Elijah goes and he enlists Elisha to be his apprentice? Remember that? And Elisha's out there with 12 oxen and he's doing a field and Elijah, uh, the cloak and all that kind of stuff. Boom, right after that, we go over and see Ben-Hadad. But <clears throat> we didn't read it because there wasn't any prophet action right after that. But that's, that's where we first see Ben-Hadad. He's in the first and second Kings story quite a bit. King of Syria. Uh, so he's not, he's not unknown to us. He's a longtime adversary. Verse 25, and there was a great famine in Samaria because of the siege, as they besieged it, until, how bad was the famine? Until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung was five shekels of silver. What? Yeah, well, you know, so um, a donkey's head. There you go. Nah. A donkey's head was worth a lot of money. Well, there's not much to eat on a donkey's head. 
Uh, that's the unfortunate. And in fact, it wasn't, a, the donkey's heads weren't as cute as this. You know, they were dead. So, uh, so we're talking about a donkey's head as a source of food was extraordinarily expensive. The price of a car today. That's how bad the siege was. And then also uh, dove dung. Yum. Yum. Well, you didn't eat it, Pam. Or whoever said that. Joyce, who says it? <laughs> Sorry, I just heard a voice over here. <laughs> no, no, you, you would scrape it off stuff and collect it and use it for fuel. You, you could burn it once it was dried. I, I know, you don't eat doves. <laughs> Come on. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, so this is the problem of the siege. Even if you do find some food, like for instance, you know, a donkey's head, you still have to cook it somehow. Well, when you're under siege, you also don't have much fuel. So you, you use whatever you can use for fuel. And so the doves could fly in and fly out. You know, they would, they would you know, poop on the statues or whatever they did. I don't know what they did. You could scrape that off and dry it and burn it. Don't, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, this is, this is just the writer's way of saying the siege was really bad, okay? That's in vernacular that we can't relate to, but I thought it was worth a couple pictures. So there you go, okay. So now <clears throat> it goes on. We're still under siege. Now as the king of Israel, who's not a really good follower of the God of Israel. In fact, he's not at all. Likely the son of Ahab, Jehoram or Joram, however you want to call him. So the king of Israel, he was passing by on the wall. You could walk on top of the walls. He was passing by the wall and a woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, the king. Well, that, which, which makes sense because everybody's starving. You know, she doesn't have enough food. Help me, O king. And of course, his answer back to her is somewhat flippant. What he says is, well, if the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? Like from the threshing floor or from the wine press? I mean, if God's not helping you, what do you expect me to do? You know, there's no grain on the floor of the, there's no wine, there's nothing. I mean, what do you expect me to do? If God's not helping you, what do you think I can do? It's very flippant. It's very heartless. It's, it's yeah, it's sarcastic. Yeah, so if the Lord won't help you, what am I supposed to do? Now, at this point, if you stopped reading this story, you would presume what she's asking for help is, is just food, because it's a siege. But it's not. It's even worse. It's darker. The king asks her, so what's your trouble? Another kind of flippant question. <laughs> Everyone's starving. You got a problem down there? What's your trouble? And she says, this woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day, I said to her, give your son that we may eat him. But she's hidden her son. Wow. It just doesn't sound so bad. It's really bad. I mean, it's, it's sad. And if you think about this for a second, what she's complaining about is injustice. And what's the injustice? I kept my word and she won't keep her word. Not that the sons are being eaten. And that's why I put that picture in the upper right there. It's such a contrast to normal maternal instincts <coughs> that when you hear this and what she's complaining to the king is, I want justice so that this woman will go for what she said she'd promised she'd do. And he sees this and flips out like we do. We see it and flip out. And, and you have to, have to understand, too, in the narrative here, they're very specific to say these just weren't children. These were sons. And a son is the future for your family. I mean, you're literally eating your future. Where are the husbands in all this? Presumably the husbands are dead, or else they'd be, you know, they wouldn't be doing this. So she appeals to the king and says, I made a deal with this woman, and so we ate my child yesterday, and we're supposed to eat her child today, and she reneged and she hid. So you need to bring some justice here. What she expect the king to do? She expects the king to say, yes, we'll find her and make sure that she brings the baby so that you two can boil that child today and eat it. Thank you. That sounds so bad. Ah, oh, it's, I mean, it's just gut-wrenchingly bad. It's, it's darker. It's probably one of the darkest things you'll read in the Old Testament. It really is. Oh. So how does, how does uh, Jehoram respond? Well, the king heard the words of the woman and he tore his clothes. That's an act of grief. Um, he tore his clothes. And now he, as he, he was passing on the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his body. Again, another sign of grief and of mourning for, for what's going on. It's a general display since he's walking on the wall and mourning for all the death that's happening in the city because of the siege. But I, I think more so when he hears that this woman went to justice so that her neighbor will provide the baby that she promised she'd provide that's justice? 
You know, we're, we're eating our very future. We're going against everything God made us to be as women and as mothers and everything. And, oh, this. So, you know, he has good reason to do this. So who does he blame? Guess. <laughs> May God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains in his shoulders today. And so now we actually have a flashback to Elijah's days. Remember, Elijah had his dust-ups with Ahab and Jezebel. And when anything went wrong, who would they blame? Elijah. Not even God. Elijah is causing this. And now we've returned to that entire thing. Their son, Jehoram, is saying, okay, if I, I'm promising that by this day tomorrow, if I don't have the head of Elisha, then God can take my head. That's how committed. That's what he's saying. Right? That's, the, that's how you do it. I'm committed to this. Elisha's at fault for this. Elisha dies. So, Yeah. They are, they are sort of blaming God, but the logic doesn't work well because if, if Elisha is the mouthpiece of God, why do they think if they kill Elisha, God's going to be good to them? Well, I don't know. But God is included in this because Elisha said, I'm just speaking God's words. But somehow, somehow, illogically, they're going to blame Elisha. He's bringing this on us. Or maybe, maybe he's fallen down as a prophet and he's not, he's not, beseeching God on our behalf act well enough so we're suffering because he's not doing his job I don't know but he's going to blame Elisha so he wants to take the head of Elisha basically blame him for all this nastiness that's going on which brings us to the next scene and he starts the plot to kill Elisha in verse 32 so Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him so these are like the city managers of Samaria the elders are sitting with him and now the king had dispatched a man from his presence This is the assassin. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Murderer is not actually the assassin. It's the king. Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door, hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet (coughs) behind him? So you see what's happened? Elisha's there with the most important men of the city and of the, of the country in a sense. They're there right there. He knows that the assassin's coming. And he also seems to know that the king himself is coming behind the assassin, probably, presumably to confirm the kill or something. But, the, but it looks like in a second we're going to have the assassin there. We're going to have the king there. And maybe the king's cohort that protect him, the king's guards. I mean, they're coming. So he says, I know they're coming. Do this thing with the door and uh, we'll kind of defeat the entire plot. <laughs> So while he was still speaking with him, the messenger came down to him and said, messenger, assassin, this trouble is from the Lord. Ah, so we are blaming the Lord now, see? This trouble is from the Lord, the siege. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? (coughs) This is interesting because it sounds like the king of Israel speaking, not the assassin. Although the phrasing here looks like it's the assassin messenger that's talking. So, so presumably, and almost everyone agrees, looks at this, the assassin was thwarted because they knew he was coming. And then boom, boom, right behind him comes in the king. Boom, boom, comes in the king's captain and some of the people protecting him. So now we have this whole collection of people who are against Elisha, including the king and the elders of the city and the country with, with Elisha. So we have this confrontation. So very likely these words right here are the words of the king as well as his servants. And look at it again. It's really important. This trouble is from the Lord. This siege is from the Lord. Now that, that reasoning isn't, <clears throat> isn't crazy necessarily because God could prevent the siege. God could prevent the Syrians coming around and surrounding his people. God could do that and he's done that before. So the king could say, well, the Lord's done this because the Lord's dropping the ball on this. You have to be very careful in a cosmic sense of heaven when you blame God for dropping the ball on anything. But that's what he's claiming. God's dropped the ball on this And why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, this is a super important phrase because this tells us something. This tells us that God's promise of rescue has already been spoken by Elisha. In the past tense, somehow this promise, God has said, here's the siege, it's going to happen, but I will free you from the siege. That promise is right there. And they've waited and they've waited and they've waited and mothers have been eating their babies and who knows what else. And they're eating donkey heads, you know, on a stick. I don't know what's going on, but they're doing all this stuff. And so he's saying, we're not going to wait any longer because God has dropped the ball and we can wait no longer. He's not coming. Should we wait any longer for the Lord? That's a key, it's a key verse to tell us that somewhere undocumented to us, Elisha has told the king and the country, okay, we're under siege 
but God will free us from the siege. And now the king and his messenger and all the people in the room that are facing Elisha and the elders are saying, we've had it, we're done. And God's the one who's cooked our goose, okay? We're done. But Elisha says, <clears throat> and he wants to make clear, these aren't just his words, hear the word of the Lord. And he does what he very seldom does. He says, thus says the Lord. <clears throat> so remember, we don't want to wait for God any longer. We're done. He's dropped the ball. We're all dying. And Elisha says, listen to what God has to say. Listen to the Lord. Tomorrow, about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel. That's a great deal. And two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria, at the actual city gate that's been surrounded by the bad guys. 24 hours and everything will be back to normal and you'll have plentiful wheat, you'll have plentiful barley, so much so that people will be selling excess at the gate rather than just eating it because they're so starving. They're going to have excess. Now that's, that's a huge claim. They haven't seen food for a long time. We don't know how long, but most sieges go for months. They haven't seen food. So you're telling me, God's telling me, I'm supposed to believe this? That we have, we're, we're scraping eating bugs or whatever in town here. We can't find anything to eat. And you're telling me that by tomorrow, we'll have so much grain that we'll be selling it at the gates and at a great competitive price? Well, that's, that's impossible. That's impossible. And, and one of the guys with the king says that straight up. The captain on whose hand the king leaned, we've seen him before, that means, the one, that means his right-hand man is literally what it means. So the, the, the king's right-hand man said to the man of God, look, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And what he's talking about is, what if a great bond soon came and opened the windows of heaven and all the rain came down and watered the fields? You're still not going to have that much grain tomorrow. It's impossible. It's impossible. If God brought rain tomorrow and we could work our fields without the Syrians accosting us, yeah, but it would be months from now. But tomorrow? To have grain that grows, pops up, is harvested, is dried, is winnowed, is ground into flour? No, it's impossible. And, you know, he, he's got a pretty good point. <laughs> How can that happen in 24 hours? Really? Excess food in 24 hours. <clears throat> well, he shouldn't have said that. Because Elisha comes back and says, listen, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And that's where the music in the movie goes, dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you'll see it. I and mean, you just wait. You put 24 hours, you'll see it. But you're not going to get it to eat any of it. Scene three. Then out of the blue, we have four lepers looking for lunch. That's as many alliterations as I could do there, too. There's but the, the scene goes to these four lepers. Well, okay, what? So now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance of the gate. A lot of, uh, a lot of old um, Bible expositors like to think this is Gehazi, the servant of uh, the prophet who got leprosy and his three sons. We got no reason to think that, but it's kind of fun to think about. But anyway, there's these four lepers. They're excluded from the inside of the city, so they're, they're at the entrance of the gate right there. The gate, which could actually be slightly open, uh, allowing the Syrians to see, but the Syrians won't let anyone go in or out. So they're at the gate where they should be. And they said to one another, <coughs> and this is, this is kind of like a Three Stooges thing. They said to one another, well, why are we sitting here until we die? I mean, if we say, well, it's under the city, the famine's in the city, and we'll just die there. And, uh, oh, yeah, and then if we sit here... Oh, we die also. Well, yeah, so now come, let's go over to the camp of the Syrians. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea, because if they spare our lives, we'll live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> if we stay, if we go in the city, we're going to die with them. If we stay at the gate, oh, we're going to die here. But if we go to the Syrians, they might have some food, but they'll probably kill us, so we'll die there. But there's a slight chance we might live. Well, okay. <laughs> how, they, how they can think that they can wander in the Syrian camp and the Syrians will take, they'll take pity on these four lepers who are just hungry. <laughs> what? But, you know, their logic is pretty good. We could stay here, but we're just going to die. So let's do something a little different because there's a chance. Not much, but okay. I, I mean, I see the three stooges here, but there's four of them. <clears throat> so they wait till it gets dark 
they, they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. So they're going to go in kind of softly in the darkness. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. Yeah, that's the dun-dun-dun music too. <laughs> So they sneak out under, you know, just twilight, just barely good enough you can see. And that some of this language tends to give us the impression that they just didn't go to the first edge of the Syrians they came to. They actually went to the entire Syrian camp and came up from the backside. Because it was dark, it was, doesn't really matter much. But anyway, they get there and they get close enough to see what's going on. There's nobody there. Now, how many people were there? The entire Syrian army is gone. They're gone. <laughs> what? Well, the writer of Kings tells us, the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, hey, behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, mercenaries, the kings of Egypt to come against us. So somewhere, presumably in the late day, they heard thunderous sounds of approaching armies. They couldn't see them, but they could hear them. And it sounded like horses and chariots. And they couldn't see them, but they're coming. And they figured, oh my gosh, they must have gotten someone out to make some kind of pact with the Hittites and said, listen, if you come up and sneak behind the Syrians and you attack them, we'll pay you a gazillion bars of gold. Or they did that with the Egyptians. Somehow they got word out and these guys are coming against us. And now we're going to be pinched between the walled city of Samaria and these warring people that sound like they got tanks. Remember I said chariots are tanks from their perspective. And, and we're all going to die. <clears throat> so it, before twilight, they all just get up and leave. Because <laughs> they heard the sounds. Ah, fascinating. In fact, they left so fast, this mythical approach. <clears throat> they fled away in the twilight, like probably right before the lepers went out. They abandoned their tents. They left their tents set up. They abandoned their horses and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. We would call that the rapture. <laughs> I mean, it looks like everything was there. You know, the pot was on the boil on the, you know, on the stove, which is that campfire, you know, and their tents are there and their horses are there and they're, everything, everything's just there like they were there just a second ago and then poof, they're gone because they're running back to Syria as fast as they can. They're running away because they're so scared of what they're in. The entire, the entire army of Syria. So verse eight, when, you know, when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and they ate and drank. Whoa, whoa. And they carried off silver and gold and clothing and they went and hit them. <laughs> well, you know, because they, they want something for themselves. So you sit there and you feast for a while and you go, oh, I'm full, what do you say? Well, let's take all this stuff and hide it so no one takes it away from us. So they take it out of the tent they go hide it someplace. I, we don't know where, but they hide it someplace where they can get it later. And they said, hey, that was pretty good. Uh, let's do that again. So <laughs> they came back, entered another tent, carried off the things from it, and went and hid them. They didn't eat in that one because they got their fill in the first tent. So, so they're out there pillaging the camp of Syria, you know, one tenth at a time. <laughs> These four lepers, all by themselves, just out there going, whoa, this is great. You know, ah, want some wine? Yeah, here's some wine. Look, gold. Let's take that back and put it in a hole. So, so they're, they're pillaging in the dark, having the greatest time ever. They're not hungry anymore. They're getting richer by the minute. And then they have a pang of conscience. <laughs> and so <laughs> chapter 7, verse 9. So they said to one another, well, you know, we're not doing right. <laughs> I love these guys. We're, we're just not doing right. Yeah, this day is a day of good news. Well, if we're silent and we wait until the morning light, well, I don't know, punishment will overtake us. You know, they'll find out we've been out eating like pigs all night. So, okay, so now for therefore come, let's go and we'll tell the king's household. So we won't get in trouble later on. So, you know, we've had our fill. We've got two tents full of booty. We've got to do right because they found out we've been doing this for hours all night long. And in the morning, we'll get in trouble. So we need to go tell them right now because this, this is a good day. We're not doing right by sharing what we've got here. So that's what they do. So they go back. Now it's, it's, you know, it's night, it's dark. So they came and they called to the gatekeepers of the city, the guys who watched the gate and told them, um, we came to the camp of the Syrians. Now you gotta realize they're on the ground and the gatekeepers are up on top of the wall. They're saying this to the gatekeepers. We came to the camp of the Syrians and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard there. Nothing but the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents as they were. Now, come on, you're a gatekeeper. There's four lepers telling you that there's no one in the Syrian camp. And you go, 
Right, right. Sure you are. Sure, sure. But the gatekeepers called out, and it was told within the king's household. So, you know, this is sleeping time. This is night. This is way past twilight. So they send word back. The gatekeepers say, okay, buddy, if you want us to pass on that word, we'll do it. But <laughs> I wouldn't stick around because, you know. Uh. So they wake up the king with what looks like a bogus message. So the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I'll tell you what the Syrians have done to us. It's a trap. That's what we're thinking, and that's what he should be thinking. It's a trap, and he explains the trap. This is the trap as he sees it. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking, well, when they come out of the city, we'll take them alive and get into the city. <laughs> that's what they're doing to us. We're not falling for this trap. Hmm. Uh, hmm. But one of his servants said, oh, here's an idea. Let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will fare like the whole multitude of Israel who've already perished. Let's send and see. So let's set a scouting party. We've got five horses. They're doing okay. We'll send a scouting party. That way, if it is a trap, we can run through the entire Syrian camp on horseback and spot them. They may never come back. But if the horsemen don't come back, then we'll know it was a trap, right? That's a good suggestion. So he's got good guys that are counseling him and will let us send and see. So they took two horsemen and the king sent them after the army of Syrians. Right, right here, if you're like me, you're thinking, what, two horsemen? What's that? Well, this word is ambiguous in a sense. It could mean two chariot horsemen. So it could mean they had five horses and two chariots or five horses that they could do some chariots and some horses. So it implies chariots as well. So anyway, so they're, they send them out <clears throat> and they're going to go out and do a scouting mission in the pitch black dark to see if the Syrian army is still out there or maybe they're hiding. So he says, go and see. Well, they went after them as far as the Jordan. Now, if you remember where Samaria in, it's pretty far inland and up in elevation. And they decide to go in the direction of Syria, which would take them down to the Jordan River and down an elevation more than 1,500 feet. So they, they decide, well, we'll go all the way to the Jordan because the Jordan technically is the beginning of Syria on that northern end of the Jordan. So they figure, let's go down at least to the border. That's the Jordan River. So by horseback, they cut through the entirety of the northern part of Israel. They come down the Jordan River. There's no, there's no army anywhere, but there is something they find. <laughs> and behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. They're running so fast that they got to lighten their loads and chuck everything so they can run even faster. And they're just, they're leaving a whole trail of stuff. Well, that's very clear evidence of the guys on horse. It looks like these guys ran away and they were so desperate to get out of Israel that they're dropping very expensive equipment all along the way. We can track them right up to the edge of Syria. They just ran away. They're not, they're not hiding somewhere waiting for us to, to get us when we come out of the city. So the messengers returned and told the king. Wow, crazy. And now it's a food fight. Now it's time for food. For the, so then the people went out and they plundered the camp of the Syrians. They did what the lepers had done just a few hours earlier. They plundered the camp of the Syrians. And guess what? A sia, which is a volume measure, a sia of fine flour, that's the most processed flour, that takes time, was being sold for a shekel and two sias of barley for a shekel. They had that much food that they had excess that everyone ate and then they started selling Syrian grains at the gate because they had so much. You mean, even if the clouds of heaven open up and you can't grow crops, how in the world are you going to have an excess of food in 24 hours? Well, because the entire Syrian army brought it to your gates and you just brought it inside and took it. Wow, wow. And just to remind you, this is according to the word of the Lord. This, this is according to the word of the Lord. Now remember, there was a guy who decided to challenge the word of the Lord. Yeah, that's going to unfold here in a second. You know, now the king had appointed the captain, remember him, on whose hand he leaned, right hand man, to have, he had charge of the gate that day. The king said, you man the gate while everyone's running in and out and trying to you know, get the food. So you, you maintain order in the gate. But he went out to the gate a little too soon and the people trampled him in the gate and he died. <laughs> so he literally saw the excess grain for sale in the gate and he never got a chance to eat any of it. 
God's pretty good at this prediction business. And if you forgot, as the man of God had said when the king came down to him. That's how we know the king came with the assassin because evidently this is spoken in the presence of the king. So he, he told the king, 24 hours, 24 hours. The captain said, impossible. We can't grow grain that fast. We can't harvest it that fast. We can't dry it that fast. We can't mill it that fast. 24 hours, that's impossible. And, and interestingly enough, uh, those of us who've read enough Bible know that miracles are always impossible, but God can do anything he wants to. In this particular case, it's still a miracle because it's 24 hours, but it's not, it's not the kind of miracle where food just shows up from nowhere. God had already preordained the Syrians by his providence to bring the food to their doorstep. And some people would say, well, that's not a miracle. Well, yeah, it is. He said 24 hours, and in 24 hours it happened. Or the sound of the chariots. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, God can do these things. So at the end of the section, the writer of 2 Kings decides, just in case you weren't listening, let me recap the whole story for you, <laughs> which I really like. He's, he's going to recap it for us. So if you were sleeping, and again, I tell you that these stories, I always envision these stories being orally transmitted from generation to generation around a campfire, you know, and the elder, the father would tell this story, you know, and I think this is, you know, at the end of the campfire, some of the kids are nodding off or whatever. And he said, okay, wait, let me recap the whole story if you missed anything. Did you catch this whole thing? So he does this actually in Second Kings. He recaps for us. For when the man of God had said to the king, two seas of barley shall be sold for a shekel and a, a sea of fine flour for a shekel about this time tomorrow in the gate of, his, of Samaria, the captain had answered the man of God, oh, if the Lord himself could make windows in heaven, could such thing be? Uh, and he says, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him for the people trampled him in the gate and he died. <laughs> Did you catch the recap? Yeah, okay. Well, that's the whole story. And now, as always with these stories, we have to kick back, you know, we have to stroke our chins. We have to, have to say, why did God include this story for us in the Bible? There's something in this story, as well as all the stories that have come before and will after, that are highly instructive. And in a sense, you, you have to look at these stories uh, like you would look at a parable. Remember how Jesus taught parables? Well, the parables were fictional. There's nothing wrong with that. But you could extract out of those real-life circumstances deep eternal truth out of a fictional story. Eternal truth out of a fictional story. Here's a historical story, but now you have to peel out of these the same way we do with a parable, eternal truths that you can learn from this story. And in this particular story, uh, it's almost entirely about people who did poorly, <laughs> who chose poorly, not people who chose wisely. So, so in a way for us, as we look at this, and we'll look at each, each character one at a time. So you gotta put on your thinking caps and we'll, we'll analyze each character one at a time. And, and we'll look at each character and ask ourselves, what is God trying to tell us to warn us about what we shouldn't do? Okay, so that's the question right here. What are the, what are the different reactions to the promise of God's rescue? Because remember, we know, we know that Elisha had spoken the promise of God's rescue. And at some point in the middle of the story, uh, the king of Israel said, we're tired of waiting to see God come through. So the promise was always there. I will deliver you. I will deliver you. And then here's the response from the different people. So let's just go one at a time at the different people. Let's start with the two mothers. What did they do wrong, even though they knew, presumably, that God was going to get everyone out of this fix? What do they, what do they warn us about? What do you think, Mike? Yeah, it's, it's historical, yeah. Don't eat your children. And, you know, we slightly chuckle at that but we do this uh, in, in many different ways. I mean, you, it's, it's a really sober point to think about the fact that when, when you're not trusting in God's promises for your future, for future deliverance and an assured hope of what he's promised to us, and you've given up waiting, you do have a tendency to consume everything around you, including your own future, including taking heinous advantage over family members and over friends. I mean, you, you are so self-centered that the things that are, that are sacred in our culture, the things, that we, the things that we even love, we end up destroying. And uh, you, can, you can take this general concept and you can apply it in so many things in our culture. 
Because if there, if there was a solid, assured hope of a future, even if we're in the midst of the most horrible of times, if there's an assured hope of a future and, and you can place your trust in that, you don't do this crazy stuff like this here. And I, I, I've always thought in this story, what, have, what would those women have thought if it was just maybe a day or two after that event had happened? And then suddenly there was excess food in town and yet they'd eaten that poor woman's baby. And they're thinking, what, what was I thinking? I, because I would not trust in the assured promises of God, I ate my future. Yeah, Doug, you're going to say? Yeah, Baal. Yeah. Excellent point, because, because the pagan cultures routinely sacrificed their children in order to secure their futures, which usually meant fertility for their fields and stuff like that. So they were actually mimicking what God had warned Israel never to, never to copy from the cultures around them. So in a way, you could say, and I think this is a really good supposition, you could say that they had drifted away from a trust in God to a trust of Baal, to Baal. The Molech worshipers were kind of the same area. I mean, the same kind of thing. We'll put our trust in something else, but we are done putting our trust in the God of Israel, even though Elisha has told us God will deliver us. If you stop trusting in me for your protection, this is what's going to happen. This is, this is the natural course of things. And by the way, too, uh, can you check this? Lamentations... 410. Oh, okay. Yeah, Lamentations 410. I was going to say 20. Lamentations 410. Now, Lamentations was written by Jeremiah about 150 years after this when the second captivity from Babylon happens. But, but he, he says that, you know, women boiled their children, uh, turning them into food at one point. S- and, he's, and he's looking back to this event and maybe events of subsequent sieges when the Babylonians and the Assyrians came in. So, uh, Lamentations 410. 410. Okay, yeah. So, this, this is the... This is as low as you can go when you decide, once you've heard the promise of God, that you're going to disregard it. Then, then you do anything in your own resources. And unfortunately, your own resources and your ability to control things includes your children, and, and, and then you end up sacrificing your children. And, and it goes without saying, abortion is a very close tie to this. Because in order to guarantee their future, babies are being killed in utero. And it's, just, it's really just to guarantee the future of the moms. So it's, uh, the parallels are just, they're spooky close. <sighs> now, to be fair, and the reason we talk about this is that you and I are made in such a way that we're really not too far afield in our flesh from these, these mothers. I mean, we, we will, without the grace of God, we can do atrocious things for our own self-preservation. And so... You don't want to condemn them and say, wow, I'm glad I'm not like them. <laughs> because without Christ, you are like them. Yeah. And you might say, well, no, that's pretty extreme. Well, it seems like it, but just remember the fact, what we're talking about in a general sense is that you'll do almost anything to preserve your future with anything you can control. And it can be the things you most love. I hate recognizing that I'm capable of that, but you are. You are. It's just, it's, it's, it's imprinted across all pagan cultures. That's, that's cultures and humans without God. But in this particular case, it's a case where these women know the promise of deliverance. They presumably heard this and they've disregarded it. Let's, let's try another one because that's, that one's shaking. Um, yeah, let's talk about the donkey. No, we won't talk about the donkey. Let's talk about the king of Israel instead. Okay. We're not going to talk about the donkey. <gasps> can I talk about the donkey? No. The king of Israel. What, did, you know, what can you learn from the king of Israel in all of this? He was clueless. <laughs> he was certainly not a leader. He was stubborn, yeah. Yeah. Clearly not a leader. I mean, clearly not a leader. Not even compassionate. He... he He didn't, he didn't care. Yeah, he didn't care. And you know, you're right. He probably had more than everyone else. Yeah. He probably had two cabs of dove dung. Yeah, he was probably eating like a king. Eating like a king. <laughs> yeah, he, he himself was God. So I mean, what's, what's fascinating to me is when the women call out to him and they say, help us. And, and then it finally, you know, 
his first response as a godly leader should say, listen, let me remind you, the prophet Elisha spoke the words of God and said that we would be delivered from this. So just hang in there, God will act on your behalf. That's what a leader would do. But instead, he comes back sarcastic like, huh, if God's not going to help you, what am I going to do? Do I have anything I can scrape off of the threshing floor? No. Do I have any grapes or wine? No. What do you want from me? He basically says, what do you want from me? If God's not helping you, what do you think I can do? Oh, flippant. And, and he's just thinking they're asking for food. And then he's just blown away when they're asking for justice so someone will keep their promise to eat their baby. Uh, yeah, Mike, what do you think? The king. use this as an opportunity to put down the real God and lift up the pagan God. And say, hey, yeah, that's right. another reason why you can come and follow my pagan God because yeah. your God ain't coming through. So he, he completely, completely disrespects the God of Jacob. You know, he completely disrespects all of his God. God. And basically puts people off in another direction. And presumably maybe the killing of the baby was that child sacrifice like the Molech Baal thing. Yeah, Doug, go over here, Doug. And his wife or grandmother Jezebel will do? His, his mother, mother Jezebel. Jezebel. Yeah, and that's where he's, he's yeah. totally influenced by her too. So. Exactly. So, so it's likely to think Baal worship is leaking in. By the way, she's still alive. We'll watch her die in two weeks. <laughs> is Jezebel in that city? Uh, it could have been. We don't see her. She could have been. Or she could have been up in the summer, the summer palace up you know, around Jezreel. <laughs> one of the two places. But she's still in the background someplace. This is her son. So, toilet. So, place your trust in God. Act- actively look toward him. Wait on him. That's what the, well, all through the Old Testament. Wait on the Lord. Why am I waiting and not acting? Because God's acted. I'm waiting for him to act instead. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm going to wait on the Lord. This'll, it'll be okay. Well, let's go to someone else. How about the captain? Oh, dun, dun, dun. You mean, even if God opened up the clouds of heaven, this is impossible. That captain. <laughs> what, what do you learn about him that you don't want to do? You don't want to doubt. Don't, don't, don't doubt. When you're, and he's got explicit revelation from God. 24 hours, and this will happen. Well, no, that's totally impossible. Not trusting, yeah. And yeah, and don't challenge God and don't claim that God's dropped the ball. Yeah, you say? Open defiance. Open defiance. God's not going to do this. He can't possibly do this. Yeah. He's basically saying God cannot do this. God made a promise and God cannot fulfill that promise because I know about the science of plants. <laughs> you water them, they grow up, you dry them out. Yeah, you know, you sift them in the air, you do, and, then, and then you wait for them to dry, and then you grind them into flour. I know the science of plants. That's not going to happen regardless of what God says. And he's like, where's God in all that science? Where's God in all that science? Yeah, I mean, and you know, his science is pretty good. But still, when you're, when you're facing the explicit revealed promises of God, you don't want to say, I don't think he can. I mean, it's really foolish. It's, it's really foolish. And, and, you know, God could have let this guy off the hook. But as a way of sort of making the case very clear, even in the recap, the recap is pretty much about the captain. And the recap is basically, look, when God speaks, you better respect that because it will happen. And just to get my point through, buddy, you're going to see it, but you're not going to eat from it. Oh, I know, this, this captain guy, he makes you want to stay, take a few steps back before the lightning bolts hit. Uh, and he didn't take enough steps back because he got trampled. There's, it's not an accident that God writes into the story for lepers finding this out. Because really, you're exactly right. The captain should have been sending scouts to find out what's happening, just to get a sense of things. And he, he seems to be clueless. He seems to be clueless. He should have been doing something on behalf of the people, and he never did. And even then, when God told him what was going to happen, he said, I don't believe it. Y- you're right. I think that's, you know, the lepers, in a sense, the lepers are the ones who sort of save the society. And we'll get to them in a second. But the captain, he he dropped the ball. He's the one that dropped the ball, not God. (sighs) Let's let's move on. Yeah, let's talk about the four lepers since you brought them up. What do you learn from the four lepers? They're they're very interesting. It's kind of a mixed bag. What about the lepers? Yeah, I think they were thinking things through better than the captain was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is, again, God uses the lowest in the society to kind of rebuke the powerful. Ah, It happens right here. What what else do you think about these four guys? 
I think they're hard. Selfish? Yeah, I think they are. Uh, until they had their pang of conscience. <laughs> this isn't right. And, and, and even still, it's selfish. Because they're saying, this isn't right. We should go tell anybody. Because if they wake up in the morning and find out we've been doing this, then we're going to be killed. Yeah, so it's still selfish in the end. Yeah, I, yeah. They're suffering going on and they still get blessed. They, they still get food. <laughs> I think they had a king's feast for maybe a couple hours. You know, and they finished the feast and they hid their stuff and they're patting their bellies and burping and go, let's do that again. And they go out to a second tent. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the, the lepers. Yeah. An, interesting, an interesting application of lepers. You're going to think I'm a little crazy right here. But, but three times Jesus says about losing your life and saving your life. You know, if you save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. That's in like Matthew 16 and in Mark 8 and Luke 9, I think. But it's mentioned three times. Well, this is an interesting application of that because what they're saying is if we stay where we're standing right here, we surely will die. So what we need to do is lose this life for the chances of potentially finding it. And, and when Jesus talks about it, he talks about it in a much broader sense. You can't really take this and use it too much as a great example because it's flawed in some ways. But there really is true the first time you hear Jesus say that, you know, you've got to lose your life to save it. What he's saying to you is you've got to leave whatever you're in right now because if you get stuck in wherever you're in right now, you're definitely going to lose your life. So to save your life, you've got to lose it for me. You actually have to start a new life with me and do that. And so it, the same effect ha- happens. I heard uh, G.K. Chesterton write about this, about a soldier in war who's pinned down from a machine gun nest. And he knows if he stays there much longer, he'll eventually get killed. What he has to do is leave this life where he's cowering down and lose it, right? Lose that and go this way because this way there's actual life. He knows he'll die right here. You got to move to find life. And Jesus says the same thing about us. If you stick in where you are right now, I guarantee you'll die. But if you lose this, If you lose this, you'll save it because I'll give you new life. So there's a certain sense of abandonment of your circumstance. Sort of risky, but when it comes to following Jesus, it's not because it's a sure promise of life. These guys use sort of that same thinking back, you know, 800 years before Jesus. So it's it's a strange application. I know you see, strange application. Any other thoughts on the lepers before we go on? Yeah, Oscar. (coughs) Say that again, I, I didn't hear they made the right decision. Yeah, even in the midst of their, their selfishness. Survive. Yeah, and they, and they survive. Yeah, and which, which is interesting. It's still selfishly driven. They're starving, but they got food. Yeah, and their and they're tiny little risk, well, not tiny, this huge risk of leaving where they are, where they'll stay as they are. At least they might live a few more days, but this big risk of going out, God blessed them anyway. There was a hand over prayer. Yeah, and... And in the four lepers' desperation, you know, one thing that occurred to me that we can't answer is I wonder if they knew that the promise of the, de- the deliverance had been made, even the 24-hour one. I, I have to believe they knew about the long-term one, but the 24-hour one, I don't know. And since they're outcasts outside of the city, they may not have known because n- none of the four of them say to each other, hey, let's just stand here because in 24 hours, everything will be fine. <laughs> so you don't know if they know that. That's how, but anyway, yeah, they're acting in a really human way, desperate, fearful and, and, and here the outcasts are the first ones to get food from God. It's pretty interesting. There you go. <laughs> so it, there's really not a lot you can say about Elisha here, except that the fact that there's, there's no n- bad things about him or necessarily any good ones, he's just there as a stalwart presence of the word of God. And that word of God changes everything. And he's just speaking it. And so, in a real sense, it's wrong for us to turn him into a superhero, like you want to do with Elijah when he does that thing on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, you know? You want to make him a superhero. He's not a superhero. And clearly, through these Elisha stories, Elisha's not a superhero. However, his adversaries think he is for their bad. (laughs) But from God's perspective, the perspective, Elisha's role is just to speak the word of God into a difficult situation and challenge people. Will you trust that word or will you not trust that word? Because trusting that word separates everything in your future. And when Jesus comes, who is the word, he basically says, I'm going to separate families because it's how people treat who I am as the word that'll separate everything. So clearly he has the same effect. It's God's word and his state. And by the way, when we speak God's word, 
I just have to say this again. It's not just God's printed words, letters, and characters and stuff like that. Think of a king who gives a command. That's the word of God. So when God speaks, he doesn't hope it happens. It happens. So there's a direct connection between reality and God's word. So when you're saying, are you going to trust the spoken reality of God or are you going to trust what meager resources you have? Watch out because you may start eating babies, figuratively speaking. Trust God's word. It's trustable. When he says 24 hours, it means 24 hours. It happens. Okay. You can read ahead if you like to the third Syrian incident. Uh, It's pretty darn interesting (laughs) too. And every one of these stories is meant to communicate something about the nature of God and our, our reaction to his word and our relation to him. And these are almost all uniformly, don't do this. Don't do this. I especially like, I know plant science and this is impossible. There's a lot of application to that today. (laughs) I know, you got to watch out. Okay, let's pray and we'll finish the morning. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful story. Thank you for, for visiting us in these stories and through your spirit giving us insight about who you are and what our uh, relationship to you ought to be and how your desire for us has always been to bless us greatly. And when we, when we doubt that and shake our fist at that and, and say you're bluffing, uh, bad consequences happen. But because, because outside of you, away from you, there really is no good. And yet we turn away and try and look for good in other places and it always ends up, it always ends up betraying us. So thank you for reminding us and, and putting a foundation under our feet that your word is eternal, it's trustable, it's sure, and we have a hope that will come to fruition because of the source of that hope and you're the source of that hope. So thank you now for this in Jesus' name. Amen. What was I saying?